by popular demand. This is the Turnbuckle Pad Podcast on YouTube.com. Respect wrestling or get out. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Turnbuckle Pad Podcast. And today I, I went out of my comfort zone. I even went out of my state to find people that just make the, spe- the business special, people that still contribute, they give good product, they give good quality. And I came across Imperial Wrestling Revolution. I want you to welcome my guest. He's the owner of Imperial Wrestling Revolution. He is Mr. Jerry Bostic. Jerry, thanks for coming on. Mike, thanks for having me, man. It's a pleasure. Now, you said uh, you guys have been running for about nine years? I've been in the business nine years. I've been running around almost two years. Okay. And we've already become the largest fortune in Oklahoma, so man, very blessed. Very, very blessed. That's actually cool to hear because I always heard, like, in the South and along the Bible Belt, you know, wrestling's pretty still rampant. So to be the, to be the biggest company out there, that says a lot. Well, yeah, there is a lot of companies. There's a lot of great talent out here, too. You know, the South is still full of tons of great independent talent that yet to be discovered. And we're lucky enough to have a few of those guys in our own company stuff. Now, there's a lot of talent out here. I believe it. I believe it. Let me ask you a question, because you're a, you're a promoter and also a wrestler. Do you see any kind of influence on the surroundings, the surroundings that a wrestler has around them? Does that play a factor into their, their determination on pursuing being a wrestler? Uh, I, I think to a certain extent. I think, you know, most of the time, the people that really want to be a wrestler are something that most of us have dreamed of our entire lives. It's just a matter of finding ways to make that a reality. Uh, I don't think you come across, you know, you're definitely going to come across people that want to do it their whole life. Of course, you are people like Brock Lesnar that, or people that have gone from the NFL to wrestling. You know, you're going to come across Al Harper or those and people like that that just come into it. Yeah, because I know in Chicago, I mean, Chicago isn't really seen too kindly in, in, among the wrestling industries because there's just something about Chicago and indie guys that nobody really wants to deal with. And I'm, I was wondering, do you do you think it's just just Illinois or Chicago, or is there is that kind of standard on every state? I think it's probably pretty standard in every state. You know, you come across so many independent companies, so many independent wrestlers. They get kind of the lines are very blurred. And, you know, you might get burned by one independent company. That might burn you for the rest of your life. You might not want to be getting in the rest of your life. You went and saw a company that wasn't good. The presentation was bad. And therefore, you have this preconceived notion about any wrestlers and independent wrestling. When in all reality, there's a lot of really good companies all across the United States that really do have a lot of good talent. You know, being in Oklahoma, and like I said, uh, with surroundings plays a factor into mind states. You know, if you're in a major city, there's a lot of congestion, there's a lot of people, there's a lot of business, so you got to be a little bit more on top of your game to be more successful in a city. Does that kind of mentality apply to like a state like Oklahoma or Alabama or something like that when it comes to pursuing wrestling? It does, because you know, even in Oklahoma alone, there's probably the state and federation in just Oklahoma. Wow. And in Texas, you know, there's a lot more. So there's, there's so many different companies. It's not like, you know, you're, you're going to have a hard time standing out if you don't have the desire to do so, you know. I mean, you're going to have to come up with the money to buy gear. You've got to find where to train. you got to figure out, you know, your character. So many different things go into it. Very true. Very true. What's some of the things that you guys look for when you're uh, building up your roster? Well, outside of having our own company that suits shows, we also have our own training school. Nice. So, you know, we like to, like me personally, I like to make it affordable because, you know, you want to let people have the opportunity to chase their dream as much as they really want to. And above all else, you want to find that great talent that's sitting out there. And you have to remember sometimes that maybe all the great talent in the world doesn't have 200 bucks a month to pay for a wrestling school or some kind of crazy price yes. or whatever. So we usually uh, we'll give guys two free sessions to see you know, if they like it or not because most wrestling fans, they have no idea what the business is really like. And, you know, the first time they did that match, it's nothing like they thought it was. You can kind of lead them out, like give them a couple of pre-sessions to kind of see, you know, who really wants to be done. You can possibly make you some great talent. And then, you know, from there, me personally, I like to work that around. You know, you guys can talk to person one-on-one about their finances. It's no different than managing a company in general. So you have to talk to each individual as an individual. Not everybody's the same. Not everybody has the same income background, et cetera. So, you know, you have to be really kind of open because you definitely don't want to miss out on talent. Because you're concerned with getting X amount of money. 
Yeah, that's a problem that I've seen being in a major city. I've seen that where you kind of got the wrong people getting into the business, whether they be a wrestler or a promoter. They're not they're not doing what's best for the business and what's best for the show. They're more just worried about what they're the, the spotlight and the money they're getting out of it. Exactly. And, you know, you know for us, this is a good example. Our company's grown so much in a couple of years. I'm actually quit working to start promoting because we got to the point where, you know, I enjoy wrestling. That was always my dream was to be a wrestler. But company wise, you know, I needed to run these shows. And I, def- I definitely at this point don't have time to do both. Being up, you know, it's like any other wrestler, you have to make your sacrifices. You know, you got to choose what's best for your company above all else. Right, and and I'm glad to hear you say that because that's not something we come across too often here in Chicago. It's it's the, it's the business mentality. I think it is. It's just it's so tough right now with the economy. We all know that the business is driven by the economy. So with the states being that it's in, I'm sure that affects it somehow. It definitely does. kind of to where you fit into this big giant puzzle and you know the way I see it outside of WWE if you want to be number two that's up for grabs I mean as far as I'm concerned any great promotion with the right opportunity to catch Ring of Honor TNA any of those guys three you know we uh, for example I mean we, we that's our goal is to catch them that's what we want right and we believe that the product we put out is a very good product and I mean we're working on our third super show in a year so we seem to be doing something right, Mike. <laughs> yeah, no, you're absolutely right. I mean, there's a lot of people who, I've seen some wrestlers who didn't want to play ball with the company they were with, took their ball and ran home and started their own company, became their own self-proclaimed champion. And in my eyes, I'm like, that don't mean anything. No, I mean, really, you know, the champion is a figurehead. That's what that is. I mean, it's not like you're you're going out saying, you know, this person is going to beat everybody up all the time. You know, you look at me, a champion is more somebody that represents your company willing to go do the things that they go the extra mile and you know like spend an hour before and after with the fans making sure that you know they're happy they got to meet their superstar take pictures sign stuff so there's a lot a lot more than being a champion for my company like just showing up wrestling in one match and going home if you're my champion you know you're going to go out and spend time with people you're going to go to events you're going to go to fundraisers you're going to make your round you know that that's an important part of our model we do a lot of uh, charity work, we help a lot of schools, and we help boys and girls clubs, toys for tots, not in way. We help countless people like that, and when we do, even before we do our super shows, we typically try to go to the schools in that area and talk to all the kids and go around the classroom and meet people. I mean, we do a lot of extra work. We also make sure, even on these shows that we run that are big, that there's always, like, an economy ticket. You know, like, you can get in for $10 to each And, you know, this day and age, I don't know how it is in Chicago, but in Oklahoma, I mean, can't really take your family to a lot for ten dollars a person to get that kind of entertainment. No, I mean especially when a in a major city like this, when taxes are so high, even if you are spending only ten dollars, you also got to consider the money you're spending on gas. Some people take public transportation, so you got to consider that in time. So you know, in the city, it could probably be a little bit harder, but maybe in places that aren't the city, it might be a little bit easier, and you get more bang for your buck. Exactly, you know. Like I said, I, at the end of the day, I have to go home and know that the decisions I made were in the best interest of myself, my company, my wrestlers, and also the people that come to see that show. So that's very important. It really sounds like you believe in your product and, you know, you care about what you show and what you give, which is very, very special and very much more needed in this business the way it is now. Well, I think that, you know, I believe that the way you treat somebody is the way that you should want to be treated, and if you do right by people, you know, it's going to come back on you. I mean, we started off years ago, and, and you know, just some of the relationships I've built through wrestling, you know, I can go to people now and say, hey, you know, I'd love to have you come in for a show, uh, to cast don't, so I mean, you know, like I have references now, it's time to treat people, and you know, they'll vouch for me, and, and go to bat for me, and stuff like that to make sure you know, like, yeah, you did people right, you know. That's exactly right. I got a question for you, because you mentioned earlier that you guys have your own training school. And one of the common annoyances that a lot of a lot of people who follow the business closely, I'm not going to say workers, but I'm not going to say marks either. They're just people who really follow and they pay attention. With, with your training school, is coming up with a unique finisher 
or come up with something new and creative, is that like a, a priority in your training school, or is that something that, hey, if it happens, it's cool. If not, just find something that'll work. We want everybody to be an individual. We, we really strive for that. Uh, you know, I believe more so that, that wrestling is about being a great character. You know, I feel like if people wanted a bunch of cookie cutter characters that are all very similar to each other, they would watch MMA. You know, if you don't want characters, why would you watch choreographed wrestling if you could watch Real Body? You know, right. I, in my opinion, it's more about characters and building those characters. But as far as move sets go, we typically want our guys to make a list of five to ten moves they'd like to do. And you can't pick the same move that another person did. You know, if so and so does this move already, then you're not doing that move. Just come up with your own stuff. Same thing with finishers. What makes you different from everybody else? You know, I mean, it's about, to me, wrestling is about, you know, you're your own best marketer. Whatever you come up with, that's you. I mean, that's, that's going to dictate how far you go in this business. It's going to dictate other bookings you get, your appearance, your style. I mean, you know, like I said, it's about what you put into it and who you are. So, I mean, you want everybody to be an individual. You don't want everybody out there doing tip top body slams and clothes on. Yeah, and code breakers and sweet chin music and RKOs and stunners no, and yeah, Jesus. No doubt. You know, it's funny because uh, Chris Jericho gives him a code breaker, and then uh, one of our guys went out and did it in a match, and it was his second or third move, and the guy got right back up. I'm like, yeah, that made a lot. <laughs> yeah, it's it's hard to see. It's hard to find guys that are innovative. You know, I was growing up, I used to watch Tommy Dreamer from ECW, and I used to love watching his performance because he was so innovative and creative with the things he came up with. Granted, granted, he may have used somebody else's move, but the way he did it, you you couldn't really stick it to somebody else. You know, it was innovative, it was creative, it was new. And I think fans are looking for that more nowadays because it's, it's hard to come across that. You're right. And, you know, this is a business where you ask yourself what hasn't been done. You know, and it's very hard to find. So you're right. I mean... You even taken somebody's moves that's been done before you and put your own personal twist to it. I mean, that makes that move unique again. You know, just like what you talked about with Tommy Dreamer. So that's, that's a very important aspect of it because really what hasn't been done very few days. Yeah, and it seems like, you know, some, uh, some independent companies, they'll just try and emulate what they see on TV and they'll tell their guys, hey, just do what you see them doing. And in my eyes, I don't think that's right at all because fans get tired of repetition and they can... They can pick out a storyline that's being repeated. If you look at the storyline right now with Becky Lynch, um, Charlotte, and Paige, it's the whole evolution storyline all over again when Randy Or Orton was champion. <laughs> yeah, they are very similar. You're right. Any wrestling fan that watches the product over and over, you can pick that out. Yeah, and there's so many new things. There's so many good workers out there that are being washed back. It's I can see why a lot of them don't want to go there and they want to stay in the independence because I think there's a lot more freedom in the, in the independence than there is when you get to like WWE or TNA or New Japan. There is, and you know, at this, at this point in time, a lot of the guys are making just as good of money as, on the indie circuit as they are, or as they would with WWE. Maybe not merchandise wise or kickbacks like that, but you know, as far as looking fees, a lot of them do very well. Like Alberto, before he went back to Sunday, uh, he's worked with me before Super Guy. You know, he does well enough on the Indies. I'm sure he didn't have to go back if he didn't want to. AJ Styles, I mean, he's never available because he stays so busy. I mean, there's all kinds of guys that are doing just fine without the WWE machine behind them. Yeah. Yeah, and sometimes you don't necessarily need the machine to make yourself known. No, I mean, it, I think it definitely helps going there at some point because, you know, there's there's no rub like the WWE rub, you know. Like in this area especially, if you have somebody that's been in TNA that's never been to WWE, maybe outside of uh, AJ Styles, you know, around this area, a lot of people don't know who they are. But if they've been in WWE at some point, I mean, you're made. You know? that's, that, run that is very, very true. We had a a guest that's been on the turnbuckle pad before, and even he said, if you sat down with some of these guys, and, and I'm just going to use my state for example, because this is what I've gone by and witnessed. If you sat down with these guys and gave them a list and say, tell me who you are and what you're about, half of them couldn't tell you. Exactly. You know, and wh where do you think that comes into play? Do you think that's lack of creativity on the, the person's part, or is that just like lack of creativity and vision on a promoter's part? I don't really think, I mean, to a certain extent, on the promoter, yes, for booking them in the first place. But you know, as an independent wrestler, you're just an independent contractor. That's, that's more or less up to you, unless you're working exclusively for a promoter, possibly. You know, that's up to you to come up with your character and to get your bookings and to be special. 
Yeah. So we have, we do have in our company, we do have some exclusive talent that works on it for us. And we do work with them hand in hand on character development. Like we help them with places to get their gear. We help them with their moves, their finishes, their interviews. We do stuff like that. But, you know, if you're out on your own, doing your own thing, then that's, that's on you, man. Yeah, I mean, if you're if you're being an independent contractor, it's just like doing business. You gotta learn how to market yourself and sell yourself. You can't just walk out there and expect to be loved, but not say nothing and not do nothing. It doesn't work that way. Yeah, you know, all these guys, even a lot of the ones WWE Hall of Famers, they all started you know, like working the territories, and you know, that's in a lot of sense, that's kind of what independent companies are. I mean, the territory concepts kind of lost somewhat. Nobody really gets that easy road to start them. So you're going to have to pay your dues and, and do what's asked of you. And, you know, like sometimes go to a show and work it for free or work for 20 bucks or whatever the case may be. You know, you get, sometimes you got to do what's good for your career and, you know, like show up early, set up the ring, take it down. It amazes me sometimes people that come along that have never put the ring up or taken it down. It's like, man, you had it easy. You know, I mean, I've been in this nine years and I still put the ring up and take it down. Yeah, I, I've heard stories, you know, and I kind of, I look back on it the way the business was so well protected back in like the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, maybe up to like the mid 90s at a certain point. You couldn't just walk down the street and say, oh, look, a wrestling school. I'm going to be a pro wrestler. It, it wasn't like that. It was very well protected and you had to know somebody that knew somebody and then they would work you and break you and hurt you. And if you came back, you were worth it. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, I think we've all heard those stories. And, you know, what's funny is a lot of the best psychologists in the business were in those eras. You know, that's that's really, like, my guys nowadays, like, that, that's what I want them to go home and watch is, like, the 80s, the 80s guys, the 70s guys, because it's a whole different aspect of storytelling as, as to what you see nowadays. Yeah. It seems like a lot of times, you know, with all these gimmick matches and stuff you see, like, it's like a spot fest, you know, it just goes from one high spot to the next. And, uh, Jim Ross actually helps me out some. And we were talking one time, and he was talking about just a general match. And he said, you know, they did a suplex out, or a superplex out of nowhere, and it made no sense. Yeah. And, you know, he's right. If you really think about it, a lot of the matches you see now, they come with these moves out of nowhere, and in no way are they telling any part of that story. But it's funny because you come, you become so used to the product that you see now, you don't even think about that. You just watch it. Yeah. Back in the 80s and the 70s, when, they, when you had wrestling, you had very few promos, and it was all wrestling, you know? And each move that <laughs> happened in that match meant something. Yeah, you know, it's funny, because one of my guys, he, he came out and cut one of those WWE promos, and I told him at the time, like, man, we got to work on that. No more WWE promos. We're not coming out there for 20, 30 minutes. You know? It's like, you got to find what works for you, and obviously that works for them. And they do have, you know, they have three hours of TV time they're trying to take up, so they have to take it up somehow. So that's not entirely their fault, but... You know, you can come out and cut a promo in five to ten minutes, get your point across, and get back to rest. Yeah, very true. I think some of these guys nowadays, like a lot of these fans and people such as you and I, the fans nowadays are never going to know how special this business really is because a majority of them don't do their homework. They don't go back and look at the history and see how it evolved, see how it was built, see how it ran. And because the business is exposed worse than a cheap hooker, it's not it's not very hard to, you know, put the math together, you could say. And they're never really going to understand why it's so special. So when you give someone like something from the 80s or the 70s, they're going to look at it and be like, this is boring. But they don't understand exactly. the, 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 the fundamentals behind the story they're telling, the psychology involved. You know, it was very plain and simple. You had your good guy, you had your bad guy. And now it's everything's so mixed up, it's like, well, who do I root for here? <laughs> Exactly, and, and you know, like I said earlier, that to me, that's what wrestling is. You know, wrestling is characters, and it's good guy, bad guy. Yeah, there's some tweeters here and there, but you know, overall, like I said, if, if you get to the point where you don't know who to root for, and everybody's just acting like normal everyday people, you might as well watch UFC. Yeah, because at that point, I mean, you could spend that twenty, thirty dollars you just spent on your friends and your family to go home and watch a pay per view, possibly even order a pizza while you're at it too. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, or. You know, you could be a good wrestling fan and go home and pay your nine ninety nine and the board of the WWE Network and watch all of that good old stuff. Yeah, you could do that or else you could not pay for that at all and just use YouTube and find a whole lot more than the network can offer. <laughs> <laughs> That's very true, but you always want to get back to the business. So subscribe to the network. It, it, you know, I, the network has a lot to offer. I will say that. I will say that. There's some bugs in it still, but 
it, it, it is solid, and I like the fact there's a, a wrestling hub for the WWE. Oh, I no do. Doubt. And, you know, it's, it's wonderful that they've added stuff even as old as World Class. And it's neat to see some of that stuff again because, you know, in our area, World Class is such a big deal. You know, the Von Erichs and the Three Birds. And, I mean, that was that was just a wonderful time in wrestling. And we actually worked with Kevin Von Erich's kids. And, uh, wow. Kevin to himself to a certain extent. You know, it's kind of surreal sometimes when you know, think, like, you're talking to Kevin Von Erich, you know, because that was the first wrestling match I ever saw in person uh, in the 80s that had come to Ardmore, which is where I'm from. And uh, it was Kevin and Kerry and some guy named Dunning Steve Austin. And, yeah, I mean, you know, it was just crazy to think about the characters and stuff that World Class had. It was, that was truly an amazing time in wrestling. So it's neat that the network has all of that on there for you to watch. Yeah. Yeah, and I yeah I am very familiar to Von Erich. So I was born in 1980, and mom and dad watched uh, WrestleMania four in the hospital room, and they still watched the Von Erichs and the Freebirds, and a lot of those other guys from that time and era. And I never understood why I was so hooked on the Iron Claw. My dad used to do it to me when he was messing with me when I was a kid, and he'd goof off in Rough House with me. And I never understood it, but as I got older, I saw the Von Erichs. I'm like, that's where it came from. Yeah, you know, it's funny how that stuff goes on. If my son will wrestle with my dad's son, my dad still uses that. That's his finisher, the Iron Claw. <laughs> and, and, you know, the, the Von Eric kids, they're, they're such great kids. Kevin's such a great guy. I mean, that family, you know, they're they're wonderful people. They really, really are. There's still a lot to be seen from them. Uh, Ross and Marshall have not been in the business very long. Uh, they did a lot of their training in Japan, and they've worked some shows. They've worked one of my shows, and they've worked a couple others in the United States. Don't count them out. Those guys are going to do something. Different. Oh, I never did. When I saw Stacy Von Erich show up on uh, TNA, I was so happy to see she, uh, Von Erich debut. But then I was like, "Did you train? Did you?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know they're a little bit better in the ring than she is. <laughs> yeah, I, I can actually think back on the history of the Von Erichs. I never saw a female Von Erich in the ring. It was always the guys. Yeah, and you know Ross and Marshall, they have the look. And it's, it's just a matter of them getting the work, you know. I mean, they definitely have Kevin to learn from, and, and that's amazing itself. I mean, you sit there, and just in one conversation with Kevin, you can learn so much about them. It's crazy. Well, check it out, Jerry. We have a question for you that we ask all our guests. And I, I can't wait to hear your answer. What advice would you give to somebody that wants into the business or somebody that's new in the business? Man, you know, I would say, because like I said, it was always my childhood dream to become a wrestler. I would say go for it. Don't let anything stop you. You know, definitely don't ever quit your day job. <laughs> you know, you need insurance and you need retirement. But, you know, chase it. I mean, I think everybody, whether it be wrestling or anything else, if you have the ability to chase your dreams and catch them, then why would you do so? And it doesn't matter. You know, like me personally, it doesn't matter if we're in, if we're in front of 20 people or 2,000 people. Every time that I step out there, whether it be promoting or whether it be wrestling, I'm living my dream. And just to look over there and see, you know, if you're a baby face and you see somebody cheering for you or to look over there and see somebody booing you if you're a heel, you know, just the impact that you make on people and the stuff that you can do for families that a lot of times don't have the money to go see anything else, but they use their money to go see you. I mean, there's so many special things about it. There's there's so much more to this business than just being a wrestler. And it's, and it's so self-rewarding and, you know, I think anybody that gets into it can look back on it when they're done and think, man, I really did that. Yeah. And, you know, you have all these positive memories to think of. And, and of course, there's definitely a, there are pitfalls like anything else. You know, I mean, getting in this business and staying in it and being successful at it are definitely not easy. You know, but if you really put in the time and effort into it and you believe in what you do, then by all means, why would you not do it? Yeah. Amen to that. Well, Jerry, man, we really thank you for stepping on the show and coming to talk with us for a little while. If fans wanted to find you, how can they do that? Uh, they can find me on Facebook, Jerry Bosick, or you can look up the company on Facebook as well, uh, Imperial Wrestling Revolution. You can check out our website at imperialwrestlingrevolution.com. We have a huge show coming up uh, called When Worlds Collide, and it'll feature uh, Ethan Carter the third, Jerry Lawler, Hacksaw, Jeff Duggan, Jinder Mahal, Rebel, Mickey James, Scott Steiner, X Pac, Scott Hall, Chris Masters, James Storm, Matt Seidel, Chavo Guerrero Jr., a whole host of people, including Jim Ross. Wow. So, you know, check it out. If you 
guys got time to make it all the way to Oklahoma to come see this show. If I cook the money to get there, I'd be on the I'll be on the first train, first bus there if I could do it. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that, brother. Not Thank a you problem. So much for having me. I appreciate it. Truly. Oh, you're quite welcome, Jerry. It's it's an honor to get to talk to somebody new and get to hear from a different state. You know, things are different. Not everything's always going to be the same in the one place that you are. You got to learn to venture out, expand yourself a little bit. Oh, very true. You know, everything's different in Oklahoma. A lot of times we get a bad picture painted about us, but Oklahoma's all right. Yeah, I love the South. I'm a country boy at heart, so I have nothing but love for the South. And I know wrestling is, is very passionate down there, so I know I'm looking in the right direction. Well, fans, this wraps up and concludes our time with Mr. Jerry Bostic from Imperial Wrestling Revolution. You know how to find him. He's not a, it's not a hard company to find, and I encourage you, if anybody's in the South or in Oklahoma, to go check this company out. I want to see them, and I can't get there, but I think you should. Until then, fans. This is Mike Stover. This has been my guest, Mr. Jerry Bostic. You want to say goodbye to the fans? Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you for listening and checking out Mike on the podcast. I appreciate it. He appreciates it. Everybody take care. We're out.